The worst nuclear accident in history happened in 1986 in what is now the Ukraine, the town and the reactor of Chernobyl. There are some remarkable differences between the RMBK reactor that was used in the Soviet Union, actually they had maybe a dozen of them, and Western reactors, or I should say the reactors in the rest of the world. This first slide illustrates the difference. Here is your standard light water reactor. Right, we have a pressure vessel, we've got the control rods and the nuclear fuel inside of it. This is an RMBK. And you might say at first, oh, I don't know, why is this, uh, you know, different than this? Now that part's not all that different. A Canadian deuterium reactor has a similar type of geometry here. The thing that's missing is this thick line. This is a containment building. And a containment building is expensive. This is the three foot thick concrete. This is the stuff that a jet airplane can hit into and the jet airplane disappears in a cloud of vapor. The building structure, the three foot thick reinforced concrete with the steel liner stays sitting right there. The purpose of a containment building is if it, all your other safety systems somehow go wrong, the radioactive debris, the fission products, the things that are inside the nuclear fuel, the bad stuff, the nuclear wastes, will not get out to the general public. The reactors in the Soviet Union, the RMBK reactors, did not have a containment building. This flimsy little white line here, it's merely a normal building, cement block, something else, nothing whatsoever designed to hold this material inside. So when people say, oh, can Chernobyl happen here? The first answer is absolutely not. We, and by we, I mean the entire world, has containment buildings. That's not the only difference. There's another very important difference, and that has to do with moderation. It has to do with the neutrons. We've drawn this graph before, but it's very illustrative. This is the chance of a fission event. Okay? And this is the speed of the neutron. It's a log graph, and it looks something like this. And this might be one, and this is a tenth, and this is a hundredth. And on this side, it goes by nine orders of magnitude, right? This could be 0.01 EV. And we have a whole bunch of these, and we come up to something like a million electron volts. The neutrons are born fast. That's when they're created by the fission. But the chance of creating a fission only happens when they're slow. So you need to have something that will slow down the neutrons, something called a moderator. All right, you say, ah, oh, yeah, I heard your earlier lecture. I know all about fission. Wonderful. What does a moderator need to be? It needs to be something similar to the mass of a neutron. So one of the very best ones is the element hydrogen. It's got one proton in the nucleus, about the same mass as one neutron. They bounce into each other, they slow down. You can't put hydrogen gas there. One, it's explosive, and two, it's a gas. Not going to hit very many things in a gas, but if you make this into water and you simply have H2O, water, as your moderator, you've got a wonderfully useful and good neutron slower. You could use other things, right? Uh, carbon, graphite, not quite as good as water, but it will slow down neutrons, and it's a solid, and you can put blocks of it there. The thing is that the purpose of all these fissions is to boil water. You want to boil water, you want to turn it to steam, and have the steam spin a turbine, the turbine spins a generator. In all of the reactors, 
except for the kind that Chernobyl was. The water is the moderator, and it's exactly the same water that you're trying to boil. And what's beautiful about this is if somehow this system breaks, a pipe breaks, someone turns off the valve, the steam all runs out, earthquake, you name it. If you lose the water, the reaction stops because there's no more moderator. The fast neutrons have a very low chance of making another fission event. So the chain reaction stops. Let's think about the situation on the other hand if carbon was your moderator, but you still cooled the reactor by boiling water. Okay? If you lose your coolant, after all, this is why you're trying to do it, but basically you might be boiling the water, but you're cooling the reactor. If you lose your coolant, your reactor gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and the reaction does not stop because the carbon is still there. That's the second reason why Chernobyl cannot happen here. We use the same water as the moderator as the coolant. If you lose one, the reaction stops. So let's take a closer look at the RMBK Chernobyl reactor. Here is a drawing, and I want to illustrate a couple points. It still has pressure tubes, right, and loops that boil water. But the moderator are these blocks of carbon, which are always there. You might say, oh, well, great, the moderator can't leave, but remember, that means the chain reaction is only controlled by the control rods. Control rods, which you could lift out of the reactor to, of course, not have as many neutron absorptions. So this reactor doesn't have the fail-safe that if you lose your coolant, the reaction stops. Every now and then, you need to refuel a nuclear reactor. Uranium has an awful lot of energy content. So every year or so, you're going to take out some of the used fuel rods and put in new ones. That month, in 1986, the Chernobyl reactor was scheduled to shut down, to be refueled. They only do this once a year, and of course, it's making electricity. The city of Kiev needs the power, needs the electricity. We come up to the scheduled shutdown of the reactor. And one of the engineers, not a normal reactor operator, but someone that wants to test out a safety system. That's what's so ironic. The Chernobyl reactor accident was caused by humans, not by mechanical failure. And it was caused by humans because they wanted to test out a safety system. You see, a reactor needs electricity to operate. So reactors have many, many backup electricity systems. Usually there's a diesel generator someplace. At Fukushima, in case the diesel generator was flooded by the tidal wave, which is what happened, uh, they had batteries, which would back up stuff. The first line of defense in being able to create enough electricity to control things is to use the same generator that you have been using. Now, maybe you're not going to power the whole city of Kiev, but maybe you can have just enough power as your turbines are spinning down, as you've turned off your water coolant, to be able to run the safety systems, to run the reactor itself for some period of time. And that's what they wanted to test. They wanted to turn off the reactor, and in this turning off phase, they wanted to see how much steam they could still generate and therefore still be able to run safety systems, just in case the diesel generators didn't kick in or maybe the time when they should kick in and so forth. So we come to that evening, all right? And here is the reactor power level. And here is time. And the reactor is humming, humming along, right? And then they, middle of the night, of course, everything bad happens in the middle of the night, and it's all been planned, and they tell Kiev, okay, guys, we're going to shut off the power, get your electricity somewhere else, hopefully the grid can do it. All right, 
And the plan was to turn the power down to something around half. Because then from this half power, they were going to start their experiment, where they were going to turn off the cooling water. They were going to see what happened if they could spin this down. Doesn't sound all that great an experiment, but that was their plan. But an operator hit the wrong button in the control room. Here's a picture of the control room. Lots of buttons. Might be a fairly common mistake. And what happened, as you can see to my uh, power level here, that instead of going here, very quickly went to a very low power. At this point, they should have just called it a night. Hey, you know, we've got the power way too low. This means the xenon content is going to come up. The xenon is a reactor poison. It's something that will not allow you to control the reactor well. But they didn't do that. They didn't know the cardinal rule. If you ever turn off or turn way down the power in a reactor, you can't turn it on for three days. So they try to do things that they should never do. Hey, let's uh, pull out some control rods. When you do that, nothing happens. It doesn't budge. Pull out some more control rods. Hey, regulations say you should never pull out this many control rods. Ah, who cares? So they pull out more control rods and more control rods and more control rods. And as you do this, the reactor becomes unstable. This xenon poisoning is building up and building up. It's becoming more and more over these few hours of a damper on the reaction. The reaction wants to simply decay away and stop. But they're having to do extraordinary measures to get the power up to their half level so they can do their experiment. So finally they release so many control rods their power starts going up. And then when they say, okay, let's try to, to do the experiment, you know, let's, let's even the power out, they try putting the rods back in, but there's another special thing that happens. When they first insert one of their rods, it actually acts as a little bit better of a moderator. Poorly designed control rods. So when they start doing that, they get up around this level, they're hoping to turn it off, but instead, it goes through the roof. An uncontrolled chain reaction, releasing enormous amounts of heat. This is not a nuclear explosion, mind you. This is just making a lot and a lot of heat. Remember I said the moderator was carbon? Like charcoal briquettes? Indeed, the carbon got red hot. Water, hydrogen and oxygen, under enough heat, decomposes into hydrogen and oxygen. Red hot carbon, that is the recipe for a very large chemical explosion, like dynamite. And indeed, what happens is that the reactor became uncontrollably hot, and it blew off the roof. And because there was no containment building, all of these fission products just blew through the roof and up into the surrounding countryside. This is a picture of what the core looked like from the air. No building in the way, nothing to stop those debris from going. There's another aerial picture right after the accident. Of course, this was quite a disaster. And the world noticed. Some of the first people to notice were scientists, I think, in southern Germany, near Switzerland. They had some detectors set up, and they said, oh, it's going to rain. Um, sometimes you can see the fallout from earlier atomic weapons tests in their very sensitive detectors. And when they were looking at this experiment and the rain was coming down, they said, oh, my God, this isn't from some 10-year-ago nuclear experiment. This looks like the entire core contents of a nuclear reactor, a nuclear reactor in Sweden with very sensitive radiation detection monitoring, because of course you want to make sure nothing goes wrong in your own reactor. 
the alarm starts going off because of the stuff coming in the air from outside. The Soviet Union was at first very tight-lipped about this. No free press, no great way to try to describe what's happening in the world. They mobilized their own fire department, of course, right in the local Chernobyl fire department. And those were the fatalities. The firefighters wanted to put out the fire on the building. And maybe they were heroes or maybe they needed more training because by putting out those fires, they absorbed enormous radiation doses. And over the next few days, got radiation sickness and maybe over the next few weeks, perished, 30 people. The reactor right next door to Chernobyl, it was a twin unit, kept operating. So it's not a nuclear explosion. This is a chemical explosion. It's like somebody put a whole bunch of dynamite into that reactor and set it off. And it blows up that building. It doesn't blow up the building right next to it. And that reactor was still making electricity. So the firefighters come in. They have problems. They need to try to turn this off. Then over the next day or two, the world starts to know what's happened because we notice from the stuff in the air, and the Russians mobilize a defense to try to stop it. One of the key things, of course, from the air was to dump in shielding. There's no containment, so one, we have to make sure there's no more chain reaction. I don't think there was at all at this point, but there's certainly still fire burning, so you need to dump stuff on top of it. And Besides just dumping things like sand, you want to dump stuff that will also absorb some of the neutrons that are left in the radioactive products. So they dump lead, heavy materials. Then over the next few days, they need to actually take this structure, the blown out roof, remember, not a mushroom cloud, but a chemical explosion blowing off the roof of the building, and they need to build a containment building after the fact. Classic example of after the horses go out, you close the barn door. And they did. They built a very impressive containment building. They call it the sarcophagus. And this had to have uh, very solid sides, very solid roof, very good containment. And of course, you also had to build under it. You had to build a containment building, a three foot thick concrete structure beneath the reactor. They mobilized volunteers from their army. And the volunteers, to get a minimal radiation dose, had to rush in, work for a few hours, and be able to come out, tunneled under the building with miners, poured all of this concrete to get the base to try to stabilize the reactor. So much easier to build a containment building first. Chernobyl cannot happen in another place because we don't use graphite-moderated water-cooled reactors anywhere anymore. And it also can't happen because we have containment buildings. What Chernobyl did do was show that you really need to rely on physics, not humans, to keep reactors safe. The fail-safe of having the water drain away and, oh, hey, chain reaction stops, is a great one. The new passively safe generation three designs that don't even need water to be there to keep the fission product, decay heat, away, can just lose that energy by convection. Again, relying on physics makes things even safer. That's what you need to know about Chernobyl.